Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gary Levinson. I'm the artistic director of the Chamber of Music Society of Fort Worth. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our pre-concert talk, a rather unusual concert. You see the plethora of stands and chairs behind me. Um, but to welcome all of you and to speak about the program, as always, my very good friend and colleague, Laurie Shulman. Please help me welcome her. Thank you, Gary, and good afternoon, everyone. This is indeed a very special afternoon. As Gary has so eloquently written in his artistic director's note on the inside front cover of your program, we have several firsts this afternoon. Um, they are equally divided between us having the privilege of introducing the Curtis on Tour ensemble of two Curtis graduates who both have well-established careers and four current students at the prestigious and excellent Curtis School of Music in Philadelphia. We also have a world premiere, which is a commission, and I believe this is the first for the Chamber Music Society of Fort Worth. And we're very proud to be the venue for this world premiere, which is by a graduate of the Curtis Institute in composition. Uh, the, we will not be doing any examples from the world premiere piece because it comes to life in performance this afternoon. Uh, we will tell you a little bit about her, but the ensemble is going to tell you a, a more about her, and they will also be speaking at a bit of length about the Alban Berg work, which is unusual because it was originally for piano solo, and we are, of course, hearing a whole program of string sextets, which adds to the configuration we're familiar with of a string quartet with two violins, a viola, and a cello. It adds a second viola and a second cello, and allows for a much richer string sound Absolutely. that actually approaches a small chamber. Right, orchestra. exactly, rather orchestral in its texture, and it's actually beautiful to hear the two violas because the viola, as you know, covers both the tenor and the alto voices, so you really get a lot of richness and texture. We are starting with a work called The Sextet from Capriccio, which was Richard Strauss's last opera. It's from 1942, and it became the most popular of his operas after Der Rosenkavalier, which is the perennial favorite, of course. And, of course, there's also Zalame and Electra, but those are a little bit expressionist and very uh, violent, both of them. And Rosenkavalier and Capriccio have rather happier stories, more poignant stories. When Strauss wrote this opera, he did not give it a conventional overture. Instead, he wrote a sextet for strings that was labeled Einleitung, which means sort of an introduction or a way in. And it has become a successful piece on its own as a chamber music work. Uh, most of you probably know that Richard Strauss's later style did not change a whole lot from the style of the tone poems he was writing in the 1880s and 1890s. The musical language is very conservative and post-romantic, and uh, Arnold Schoenberg and his school might just as well have never existed when you consider that this work was from 1942. As you will hear in this first example, the writing is mellifluous, it's calm conversation among the six participants with just a little hint of harmonic tension. Let's hear example one, please. The movement is not in sonata form. It's really sort of a free tripartite form. But the second musical idea is very similar in character to the first one that we just heard. The mood is very similar, but you're going to hear a little bit of imitation. Just try to listen to the way the instruments are interacting in conversation. Track two, please. I 
I mentioned that the form is a free ternary form. That implies a contrasting section in the middle. And what happens in this B section is rather explosive because the strings start playing in a completely different fashion. And amid these six players, one violinist decides, I'm in charge here. Yeah, well, I think one of the things to remember about this piece is that towards the end of his life, it's so hard to listen to this music to remember that Strauss lived 49 years into the 20th century. It sounds so 19th century. But one of the things about his last works is that it becomes much more philosophical and the, the sections are not nearly as cleanly demarked as they would be, let's say, in Don Juan or in, in Heldeleben. So here the cadenza in some ways is much more operatic and so comes out of nowhere and then the, the Viola will also echo that a little bit later. So let's hear track three, please, which is from this central B section. You're going to hear the drama, the tremolando, and then a violin cadenza. Yeah, so for example, when we hear this, he has groups of five in it, which is quite unusual because you would expect fours and eights, things like that. So this is one way to kind of figure out what he was doing towards the end of his life to be much more adventurous, let's say, with rhythm, not so much with harmony. The essential premise of the opera, as is described in your program notes, is that there are two suitors to a wealthy noble widow. One of them is a poet, the other is a composer. And the question is, which is more important, the music or the words? So I took these slides because I wanted you to remember that this is the prelude to a story which is addressing a more profound philosophical issue and not just two lovers uh, competing for the hand of the lovely heroine. Uh, let's hear the track four. We're going to hear some dense chromaticism and uh, the implication of a lot of different key centers, they are arranged in what's called a sequence, which means a repeating pattern in the music that is echoed but in a different pitch level, implying a different key each time. See if you can identify those patterns. Track four, please. <laughs> This idea of a sequence has been very common in music going back to the Renaissance era. It was extremely popular with Baroque composers like Vivaldi mm -hmm. and other great composers, but Strauss is relying on tried and true methods here. Yes. We are going to move now to the music of Alban Berg, who was one of Arnold Schoenberg's prize students and also is considered a founding member of the so-called Second Viennese School. The first Viennese school, of course, would have been Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. He is a seminal character in 20th century music. The caricature on the right also shows the three principal characters. I'm, I can't remember whether it's Wozzeck or Lulu, but they're all characters from one of his two operas, and that is a famous caricature. The the piece that we're going to hear was originally written as a one-movement sonata. It was uh, Berg's Opus I. He wrote it while he was studying with Schoenberg and originally intended to add a second and a third movement, and Schoenberg just said, you've obviously said all you have to say. But Berg was very much under the influence of Schoenberg, but he was still writing in a highly chromatic language that goes even farther than what Strauss would be doing three decades later. And this sonata is built on the principle of what Schoenberg called Grundgestalt, which is uh, translated for you or explained for you, identified on the slide on the screen. This principle of Grundgestalt has kept theorists on both sides of the Atlantic at each other's throats for years. Here is a typical, my first example is the first three measures of the Berg Sonata. And this is what they look like on the printed page. 
And what you're seeing there is music theorists' ideas about how to analyze what's going on in these three measures, which essentially are giving you the building blocks for the entire piece, which is, I think, 11 or 12 minutes. And it costs a lot of money in grants. Yes. <laughs> so all of our examples are piano examples because we are going to be hearing a string sextet arrangement by um, Jaime Muller, who oh. was the second violinist of the Artemis Quartet for many years. Uh, but I want you to get these intervals and this chromatic language in your head because it's going to help you better understand what the strings will be playing. May we hear track five, please? And for those of you who read music, this is what you're hearing. That last chord outlined B minor, which is the ostensible key in which this sonata mm -hmm. is situated. However, Berg goes really far afield, doesn't he, Gary? Yeah, well, he, he knows what he's going to go with. And even though this is a very early work, you can see that he's already looking forward to that second Venus school. It's just that important for us to remember that Alban Berg was a very romantic composer. He was if indeed. Those of you who know Lulu and Wozzeck, and certainly the Violin Concerto, yeah. it is an incredibly romantic work that uses a language of serialism or 12 tone, I suppose, you know. Even after Berg adopted the 12-tone method, which Schoenberg codified in 1921, I think it was, he made his pieces sound like they were still somehow Absolutely. rooted in tonality by the way he shaped the 12-tone row. At any rate, the next example, which is track six, is what Schoenberg would have called a developing variation, and it's expanding the writing to as many as six parts. Um, but you'll recognize the dotted rhythm, uh, which is pretty easy to perceive, but also those descending thirds that, for those of you who read music, are in the second measure there. May we hear track six, please? <laughs> There's a lot of expressionist angst going on in there. Very tightly knit harmonies. Yeah. Uh, this is a strict sonata form, though, complete with a repeated exposition. And the second theme is very different in character. It is gentle. It's lyrical. It has substantially less angst. Um, and to my ears, it's more hard on the sleeve romanticism and even for tells a little bit of the jazz piano era of the mid 20th century. Let's hear track seven, please. <laughs> And Berg's closing theme, which occurs at the end of the sonata exposition, is really more on the idea of Schoenberg's developing variation, this Grundgestalt idea. Uh, and uh, you'll hear echoes of the same motives that we heard from the opening three measures. Track eight, please.
It actually helps to keep these three measures up on the screen because you start to hear these shapes echoing one another. This next example is from uh, Berg's development section and you'll hear sometimes it's expanding into eight parts at once. The pianist has to play with four fingers on one hand and four fingers on the other hand and you start to see how this would lend itself to a string player expanding it for a string sextet because certain strings so instruments can play the double stop will produce two pitches at the yeah, same time. Yeah, and also time. you have incredible color and warmth to it. Yes. So let's hear track nine, please, from the development. here he's definitely getting a little hot under the collar <laughs> there. <laughs> and it's also, uh, having heard the rehearsal, I can say to you that you can look forward to that color I alluded to before, that string color and the sort of the difference between the different instruments makes this density actually less dense, which is nice because you can focus on different parts of these chords rather than sort of have a wall of sound at you. Yeah. My last example from the Berg is taken from the coda at the tail end of the movement. It's bleak, it's defusing tension, it will eventually resolve into very dark B minor, but he takes a long while getting there and I have intentionally ended the example where it's just hanging in midair and you're waiting for that last chord to hit. Track 10, please. Notice the sepulchral lower level of the piano keyboard. It does end in B minor, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> he, lead, he keeps you guessing there a lot oh, yeah. of the way. All right, we are going to move now to our world premiere composer, Alyssa Weinberg, who is also being performed for the first time on the CMSFW stage. As I mentioned earlier, she is a graduate of the Curtis Institute. And the piece that she has written, Illuminating Arches, was inspired by a hike in Arches National Park. Her composer's note is well worth reading. It is in your program. And it's, it's very poetic, very personal, just a spur of the moment impressions from looking at these fabulous vistas that are available in many of our national parks. And this particular one, she was just inspired by arches. So these are the images that we will want you to keep in your mind's eye as you are listening with your mind's ear. And as I mentioned, members of the ensemble will be telling us a little bit more about their collaboration with Alyssa Weinberg. And For sure, yeah, and also by the Berg. But one of the things that I, I want to mention is that the so-called um, composers that we hear all the time, Brahms, Beethoven, were so often inspired by nature and some of these majestic views. I, I really think we can make a correlation between what we see, what we hear from Melissa Weinberg's piece, and also standard repertoire. It's really, really something that exists on practically every concert we present here. So now we move to one of those composers we hear all the time, and we're always so glad when there is Brahms on the program, because who, <laughs> who doesn't love Brahms? Right. He wrote two string sextets um, in the late 1850s and early 1860s. They're his Opus 18 and his Opus 36, and they're both masterpieces of the genre. The Opus 36 sextet, uh, both of them were written while he was in service to the court at Detmold, Germany. I've got a couple of slides of Detmold later. But but this one has been nicknamed the Agatha Sextet because its opening 
motives. It's two superimposed fifths, which sounds very clinical and music theoretical, but it's actually pretty easy to hear in the opening gesture. Of it's also the way string instruments, except for the bass, are tuned. Yes. So it is a very natural sort of overtone series where it opens. And the background to this story is that he had been seeing a lot of Agatha von Siebold, and everyone thought, including his good friend, um, the now widowed Clara Schumann, that he was going to propose to her. And he very famously stated, I cannot wear fetters, which was his concept of what marriage would be, evidently. Anyhow, um, he basically didn't treat her very well. Clara was very annoyed with him for a while, and she never married. But he must have had lingering feelings because he memorialized her. That opening motive in musical notation spells the letters of her name in German. And that's why it's been called the Agatha Sextet. Anyhow, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. I want to play the opening so you can hear those two superimposed fifths, which are going to ex express a sense of tonal ambiguity because they very clearly imply two different keys, but they are unfolding against a kind of seesaw what would you call it? Yeah, well, I, I mean, the, the opening is, is a second followed by a fifth. So there is a foundation that he gives you, and then the melody itself is this overtone series, which we talked about before. The foundation is a little rippling figure that's very exactly. constant in, 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 in the lower viola. voices. Let's hear track 11, please. This is the opening of the sextet, first movement. Now, let's, let's just talk about the intervals for a second. So you have the G to the F sharp with the opening, which is a second, and then you have the fifths that Laurie talked about. The beauty of this is that the next interval is also a second, so he can constantly moves, moves the ante, if you will, up in making that very first statement rather ambiguous, but also moving it forward. Our next example is the transition and then the statement to the second theme. What I'd like you to notice is that that rippling undercurrent figure is still there. So it's sort of providing connective tissue and it um, drives through building through a crescendo to the luxury of six voices in their full splendor. It's, it's really quite, quite marvelous to hear. Track 12, please. It's a lovely build, and at the same time, he never stops this feeling of this is delicious music to listen to. Totally, and just coming back to the first theme group, it's a it is a vertical thing that goes up a fifth, down a fifth. This is horizontal that goes in length rather than in width. And that rippling figure is below lower notes in the cello that are functioning as what we call a pedal point, a steady pitch while that crescendo is happening. It's just masterful writing. Uh, our next example, we're moving to the second movement, the scherzo. Scherzos are usually sprightly and fast. This one's more delicate, and it's not in triple meter. It starts out in duple meter. Uh, you'll hear a pizzicato underpinning, and it's implying, well, it is in G minor, which is the parallel minor of the home key of G major. Let's hear track 13, the opening of the scherzo. The trio section that follows it could not be farther apart in character. It is downright rambunctious, and it is in triple meter. It's kind of the Austrian folk dance, the Lendler, which was a cousin and a precursor to the waltz, but in a very brisk meter. And it's super high-spirited, but the, the sense of folk music and folk dance is very much there. Track 14, please. <laughs> You need to 
remember all the Hungarian dances he I wrote. I was just <laughs> thinking that's a, got a distinct Hungarian accent yeah. to well, it. And, and also the scherzo, we should really mention that the scherzo, which means joke, is almost forever dark in Brahms, but this is not a dark, this is more of a Dvorak-style folk scherzo, and then this crazy country dance is really wild. Is it fun to play? Oh, my God. <laughs> so jealous of these six. Yeah. All right, the, the third movement is an extended set of variations, and for, because of time constraints, we don't have time to linger and walk you through all of them, but I think everyone understands the variation principle, and the way Brahms developed variations was so much of an advance in the Romantic era over the way variations happened in a sort of formulaic fashion in the late classical era. And this is a splendid example of how the fertility of his imagination just never let up. I did pick one of the variations from the slow boom, and it's very gentle and flowing. It captures the mood of that glorious opening from earlier. And you'll also hear another pizzicato undercurrent, something he returns to in multiple places in this sextet. May we hear track 15, please? Brahms waited a very long time to write a string quartet. He published two as Opus 51, a few years after these sextets, and then he uh, wrote the final one, which I think was Opus 67. And I think in general, like with yeah. strings and orchestra in his first symphony, he was 50 years old when he wrote it because of the shadow of Beethoven, so obviously it, this is here. It was also the, sh the fact that he himself was a virtuoso pianist, and he was more comfortable writing chamber music when it included a piano in the ensemble, whether it was a duo sonata, a piano, piano trio, a piano quartet, or his magnificent F minor piano quintet. And he really quintet. benefited from his friendship with Joachim. No question. Because of, of Joachim being not only a great virtuoso violinist, but also he had the quartet. And he also had some compositions, which we know, of course not as great as Brahms, but he did yeah. know how to compose. I think that in these two sextets, it's his most successful string writing prior to probably the variations on a thing sure. by Haydn. And he was learning how to handle the strings, and I think he succeeded magnificently in this work. It's been one of my favorites for a long time. Uh, I have two examples left. They're both from the finale. And this first one underscores the ambiguity between major mode and minor mode that was outlined in at the very beginning of the first movement. It's also something that relates him very closely to his friend and uh, contemporary Antonin Dvorak, who was also his protege in a protégé, way. Yeah. Yes. And in a way, it also foreshadows the symphonies of Gustav Mahler, which rely very heavily on this ambiguity of major and minor in the same piece. Let's hear track 16, please. He can't really make up his mind, can he? No, and it's also what you hear under all of this melody is you hear what is a gig rhythm, which moves it along and the harmonies are on top of it. Brahms, like Beethoven beforehand, was extremely interested in counterpoint and was very skilled at writing some monumental fugues. Those of you who have either heard and loved or sung the Brahms Requiem know that two mighty choral fugues in it are major dramatic highlights of that splendid work. There is a fugato in the finale of the Opus 36 sextet, and you'll hear this time we have a return of the tremolo idea, this kind of ripple figure from the movement's beginning and another build to a big climax. Let's hear track 17, please. Thank you. 
the final analysis, I don't have any problem returning to one of those guys we hear on a regular basis. <laughs> it's a gorgeous piece. It's a long piece. That's why it gets the entire second half. Yeah, but it's also a masterpiece, as you alluded to. And I just wanted to keep, keep in mind, when you listen to this fugue, it was Mendelssohn who rediscovered Bach, who was the greatest polyphonist of all time. And for the, the Schumanns, the friends of Brahms, of course, would study these things because they didn't have the internet and you know, this is what they did in their spare time. <laughs> so for a young Brahms to write a masterful fugue was probably his calling card saying, see, I can do this too. So yeah. enjoy this incredible work and in this yes. incredible concert. I would just have to point out as a pianist though that there's also a pretty incredible fugue at the end of his Variations on a Fugue by Handel, which oh. preceded this work by a year or I two. Think he did it all the time. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Anyhow, it's a glorious program. The ensemble will be telling you more about the Berg and the Weinberg. I'm so glad you're all here and enjoy the concert. Thank you.